In the last video, we learned how to create a confidence interval when your data is what's called categorical binary. In other words, a confidence interval for a proportion as opposed to a mean. And maybe you remember the last time when we talked about confidence intervals, there was always these first three steps, shape, center, spread, picture, and your conclusion. But sometimes there was also a fourth step added on. It had this weird formula that I told you you didn't have to memorize uh, that I would always provide you with. And it allowed you to find a sample size if your margin of error was specified for you. It turns out that when we're dealing with proportions, it's got kind of the same thing. You always have these first three steps, but you could also sometimes have a fourth step that could be added on at the end. And what I'm going to do in this video is show you how to deal with that fourth step. So maybe you remember from the last time we talked about this, that the margin of error, which by the way, is just the distance from the center to either of your endpoints here. All a confidence interval is, is your point estimate plus or minus your margin of error. So in this case, the margin of error is 2.697% because 16% plus 2.697% gives me this 18.697%. Anyways, that margin of error, there's a formula that creates that. You don't need the formula that creates that because you get it straight out of your calculator. But where it comes from, the margin of error is just some number, some special number of whatever your spread is. All you do is you go up and down by some special amount of these things right here. So what I'm saying is the margin of error is just some special number, which I'll use the symbol Z with a little alpha divided by, in the two, divided by two in the subscript to represent. This just means some special number of whatever the standard error is, the standard deviation of your sampling distribution, which was P hat times one minus P hat divided by N. This is true, this is what the margin varies. You never have to use this formula because your calculator does it all behind the scenes for you. But if you calculated these by hand, this would be very meaningful to you. Well, if we're interested in N and we know the margin of error, this formula gives me the margin of error if we know N. But what if you knew the margin of error and you wanted to find N? Well, I can solve for this thing algebraically. I can get the N all by itself, right? I could uh, square both sides of the equation to get rid of the square root, make this part squared, and then I can multiply the N up here and divide over here. I could solve for N algebraically and get that N is equal to something squared that something is z sub alpha over two divided by the margin of error and then it gets multiplied by p hat times one minus p hat you don't have to be able to go from this step to this step in fact you don't need this top step at all you can kind of think about this as a formula that will always be provided for you but rather than just write a formula i wanted to kind of motivate it a little bit show you where it comes from if you're good at algebra you can turn this into this is the point they're really the same thing. This will be the form that you'll want. And no, you don't have to memorize it. I'll always provide you with this. So suppose you were doing a question like number four here. And so what number four might say is, all right, you already created your confidence interval. As I talked about, the margin of error in this confidence interval is 2.697%. Suppose you want a margin of error of, I don't know, 1.5%. Again, it was currently 2.697%. I want it to just be 1.5%. Well, there's two ways I could decrease my margin of error. The first way is to reduce my level of confidence, but that's not what we're going to do. The next way is to reduce the spread to make this a smaller number. The way you can make the spread smaller, the way you can make any fraction smaller is by making the denominator of that fraction bigger. In other words, you can increase in. Suppose you want a margin of error 1.5%. How large of a sample would you need? It's a fancy way of asking for N. Right, you're given the margin of error, that's that 1.5%, and you're asked to determine N. And I'll provide you with this formula, this one, the one in the box right here. So you're like, all right, to figure out N, I need to know, man, this formula is ugly. Yeah, but it's not as bad as you'd think. A lot of this stuff we already have. We already have P hat, which means that we kind of have one minus P hat as well. Those were given to us in the problem. That is the 16%. Right? In this version, note that I gave you P hat, and I also made this big deal about if I don't give you P hat, but instead give you X, make sure that you can calculate P hat. At any rate, you have P hat, which can go straight into this formula is 0.16. That goes in here, and that goes in here. Margin of error, that's also given to us in the problem. That's this 1.5%. 1.5% 1 
It always is going to tell me the margin of error. If I write 1.5% as a decimal, it's 0 0.015. Could you take the 1.5 and you move the decimal place twice? So I have this thing down here. Right? Really, all I need is the numerator up here. If I could get this number, I'd essentially be done. I'd just be typing things into my calculator, dividing and squaring and multiplying and subtracting. And I can do that. I could find z sub alpha over 2. In fact, we've done that before. We did that last time we saw confidence intervals. And that z sub alpha over 2 and this z sub alpha over 2 is the exact same. So as a reminder, the way you find z with little alpha over 2 in the subscript is a three-step process. Step one was to find alpha. Alpha is given to you in the problem, typically not explicitly. Instead, it tells you the level of confidence was 90%, and that tells you that alpha is 10%, because alpha is always one minus your level of confidence. So your first step would be to find alpha. You say that's 10%. Yeah, you don't want alpha. You want alpha divided by 2. So step two is find alpha divided by 2. Divide that number by 2. Well, if alpha is 10%, alpha divided by 2 is 5%. Step three is, okay, find z with a little 0 0.05 in the subscript. Right? Because alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.05. If I want z sub alpha over 2, I want z sub 0 0.05. Maybe you recall that what z with a little 0 0.05 in the subscript is defined to be is the point way over to the right in your distribution. How far over to the right in your distribution? So far to the right, but the area right of it is only 5%. The subscript indicates how much area is to the right of the point that you're looking for. And the fact that we're using a capital Z here indicates that this is supposed to be a Z-score. If this is a Z-score, the center is 0 and the spread is 1. To find Z-scores in your calculator, you're using inverse norm. And the area to the left of the point that I'm looking for will be 0.95, because 5% is to the right of it. And then my center and spread are 0 and 1 because I put in 0 and 1 when I'm looking for z-scores. And if you do that, what you'll end up getting is 1.645. I'll show you that in a minute. That is z sub alpha over 2. That is what's going to go into my formula right here. If you have that, you have all the pieces of your formula. Let me first show you the inverse norm part. So reminder, inverse norm, it's under the distribution menu in your calculator. Second, then variables. Third thing listed says inverse norm. The area to the left of the point I'm looking for is what it wants, and that's 0.95. The center that I want, be careful, it's zero. It's not 0.16 because I want the z-score. I don't want a proportion, I want a z-score. So it's a zero and the spread is a one. If I hit enter, it spits out this number which rounds to 1.645. It's a good idea to not round this number in your formula. I don't really care as far as tests go, but on the homework sometimes it's really picky. Use this whole number unless it explicitly tells you to round it in the homework and divide that by the margin of error, which is 0 0.015. And that gives me what's inside the parentheses. But I want to square what's inside the parentheses, so I'll just hit this x squared key. That gives me this number. I'm not quite done. I have to multiply that by p hat and then by 1 minus p hat. So I can just hit times 0 0.16 times 0 0.84. As long as you don't have multiple terms, as long as you don't have pluses and minuses in here. You don't have to worry too much about the order of operations. At any rate, you hit enter. It spits out this number, 1616.11. That would be my value of n. If you give me this value of n on a test, you get full credit for, you, for it. It's great. It's a perfect answer. Technically, maybe you recall from last time, whenever you're looking for a sample size, you always round up to the nearest whole number. So it's a different type of rounding. You take this and you round it to 1617. And I know that seems weird. I know if you round to the nearest whole number, it's 1616, 16, but you want to round up to the nearest whole number. So you always increase this by one if you have any decimal over here, not just something where the first digit is five or greater. At any rate, my answer would be 1617. That would be the sample size that I would need in order to create this margin of error. That's what n is equal to. One minor point. You can figure out your sample size if you have a given margin of error before you even calculate p hat. And you might be like, whoa, 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 that would be impossible. How would you ever do that? If you don't know p hat, how are you going to use this formula? Well, I'm telling you, if you don't know p hat, if it says in the problem, and I'll never ask you to do this. This might show up in the homework. That's the only reason I'm telling you that. If it doesn't tell you p hat, if it says you have no prior estimate 
for the sample proportion or something like that, use 0.5. That's all. Typically, you'll have p hat given to you. But if it ever explicitly tells you, hey, you don't know what p hat is, and you're like, damn, how can I figure this out? If you don't know p hat, use 0.5. But whenever I ask you this on a test, it'll be part four. So you'll already have P hat because you will have already done parts one and two and three. So you don't have to worry too much about that last little comment, except for possibly in the homework, I don't remember. If it shows up in the homework, I'll make a big deal out of it in the homework and remind you of everything that I just said now. Then.